Welcome back. In a moment, we'll find out about a weather satellite that could save lives. But first, here are some other stories to keep an eye on. In Myanmar, local police have started training and arming non-Muslim residents in Rakhine State, where officials say militants from the Rohingya Muslim group pose a growing security threat. Human rights groups say the move will raise tensions in a region where hundreds of people died in clashes between Muslims and ethnic Rakhine Buddhists in the last month. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in Cuba and was formally welcomed to the country by President Raul Castro. Trudeau is seeking to further strengthen trade and cultural ties, with his visit coming 40 years since his father, former Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau, visited the country. And three Venezuelan lawmakers at the centre of a dispute with the country's top court have stepped down following an agreement meant to ease a political standoff between the opposition and President Nicolas Maduro. The move was agreed in talks backed by the Vatican between the two sides. It will look down on us from 35,000 kilometers above the Earth. It's the size of a bus. It could save thousands of lives and tell you if it's going to rain tomorrow. Here's Insight's Ty Genright to explain. Good evening. I'm speaking to you from the city of New Orleans. Nearly empty, still partly underwater, and waiting for life and hope to return. Eastward from Lake Pontchartrain, across the Mississippi coast, to Alabama and into Florida, millions of lives were changed in a day by a cruel and wasteful storm. Hurricane Katrina was one of the costliest and one of the deadliest storms in American history, killing more than 1,800 people. The disaster became highly politicized. Citizens accused the U.S. government of not doing enough. The White House said that a lesson had been learned. Eleven years later, and it's feared that climate change will make extreme weather more common. So scientists are welcoming the launch of the Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite R series, which will be known as Gozer for short. 14 years in the making, Gozer will capture images of weather patterns and severe storms every 30 seconds over the Western Hemisphere. It's hoped that the increase in frequency will lead to more accurate weather forecasts, particularly for severe weather. It's a joint effort. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration teamed up with NASA to develop, launch and operate the satellite. The Gozer program is co-located at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center and is scheduled to be launched from Cape Canaveral in Florida this weekend. If weather continues to become more extreme, it's badly needed. Faster, more accurate data from space on severe storms, forest fires, smoke, pollution and volcanic ash on Earth will give those in the ground more time to prepare and head for safety. Ty Genwright, reporting for Insight. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined by Professor Matt Collins, the Joint Chair in Climate Change for the British Meteorological Office. Uh, Professor Collins, you need data, of course, but you need the right kind of data. In what way will this new satellite help? Well, we have to um, understand how we forecast whether we um, have big computer models of the atmosphere, which run on powerful, powerful supercomputers, and we have data observations that are, are blended with those models in order to run forward uh, in time. So as we improve models and we improve our computing power, um, we also need to at the same time improve our observations, and that will lead ultimately to uh, more accurate predictions. And the sheer volume, or is it the quality of the data that this satellite will provide, is what is exciting everyone? Um, well, it's both, uh, uh, in fact. So um, as we get um, more um, wavelengths and more um, greater, uh, smaller pixel sizes within the satellite, that gives us more um, accurate uh, information. And also the time uh, resolution. The crucial thing about this is uh, that it gives us a refresh uh, of the image uh, very frequently. And away from the actual day-to-day -day forecasting of weather events, in what way does this help with climate change science? Monitor what's happening 
uh, in the climate system and we use uh, a range of different techniques for doing that, some surface based uh, but increasingly using satellite uh, observations and they are put into blended uh, data sets and for example uh, 2016 is, is likely to be the warmest year globally on record and without these satellites we wouldn't be able to know that. Right, so they're a useful tool but it's also the case, isn't it, that the rate of change is said to be slowing or maybe that was a different data set that I was looking at. <laughs> I mean, the, the, over the, maybe the past uh, couple of decades it did appear that the rate of uh, uh, warming, global warming had slowed, but it's really picked up in the last uh, couple of uh, years. So this year looks likely to be the third year in a row where we break the record for um, global, globally average uh, temperature. So I think um, we've really seen almost now, um, rather than a slowdown, a sort of speeding up of the warming. Okay, and are we looking at the right bits of the globe? Because clearly this weather system um, or this satellite is able to have um, a certain area of the globe it can look down at and measure things. There are complementary satellites I know appearing elsewhere and being able to look at other parts of the planet. Do we have sufficient, do you think, in our armory? Um, for, for this particular kind of constellation of satellites, these are geostationary um, satellites, so they sit over the same fixed point uh, over the Earth, and we have a range of these all the way around. So in fact, in, the, in Europe, uh, in the North Atlantic, uh, we have something called Meteosat, and these, again, have actually been around for a number of years, uh, yeah. if not a number of decades uh, uh, now, and are constantly uh, refreshed. So we've got a pretty good global coverage um, uh, from these geostationary satellites, but also we have other satellites which orbit around the Earth and um, go over the polar regions as well. So we get a pretty good coverage on, on the satellite data. And I don't know if it's a sideline or whether it's a really important part that was built into the functionality, but it's also able to help with the uh, range of equipment that can pick up distress signals. So if you happen to be on an ocean liner or a, another vessel, a trade vessel or something at sea, it may be that you're rescued because of a satellite like this, correct? Yes, and, you know, the other thing we have to um, uh, remember as well is that if you, if you are at sea, you know, you need, you need very um, detailed representation or uh, detailed information about the weather. And again, this is a, another function of this satellite is to provide that information. Where do you need to go next? Because as a professor, you'll know what's the cutting edge of what's possible. Uh, this is state of the art, I understand, but you no doubt have got plans for the next device. What would you like to see included in that? Well, I'm not particularly involved in um, designing satellites, but my um, colleagues uh, can, um, you know, we're looking, you know, at, at higher and higher spatial resolution, higher and higher temporal uh, resolution, and now measuring more quantities. So not just measuring things like temperature and moisture, but also measuring um, greenhouse gases, uh, other pollutants um, from um, right. From um, aerosols. Give us an insight as to how a satellite does that. Oh well, it's all um, uh, to do with the uh, electromagnetic uh, radiation. So, so generally, what you're doing is taking a kind of image in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Then you have to use an algorithm to convert that into um, something that we understand in terms of temperature or uh, the level of a uh, pollutant. So, there's a whole kind of background area of meteorology. Uh, which is involved in taking the raw satellite data and processing it into uh, meteorological fields. And is this an international collaboration now? Is there an understanding that data, although the US government through its various agencies has paid for this, do they share everything? I mean, the great thing about weather forecasting is the sharing uh, of data. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of our weather comes across the um, Atlantic uh, and it's modified on the way uh, by the Atlantic, but it may start out, those weather systems may start out over the US. So if we didn't share that data, we'd have much less accurate uh, predictions. And, the, you know, these, these data sharing agreements have been around for many, many uh, um, decades uh, because weather is a global uh, uh, phenomenon. Professor Matt Collins, thank you very much indeed. We end with our insight bite, a little something that we feel you should know. Today, we leave you with a magnificent display of auroras. These are caused when particles 
released by the sun collide with gases in the Earth's atmosphere. This creates a natural light display in the sky, usually seen in regions like the Arctic and Antarctic. On this occasion, though, enthusiasts believe this spectacular show was most likely caused by dumped rocket fuel. Liquid oxygen is commonly used in rocket fuel. It's quite possible this display was down to the Atlas V rockets, which took off hours before. This was captured on a webcam at the Abisko National Park in Sweden. And that's all for now. I'm Martin Stanford. That was Inside.